thanks to all our speakers. If you wouldn't mind uh, joining me on stage, um, I would like to open up the floor to questions. Does anyone want to kick off with a question for our speakers? Looks like we have one right here. Gemma, could you do mic? Hello. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Sunit, and I'm from the uh, Institute for Global Change. Um, and I specifically work in a department that provides uh, advisory services to governments in Africa. Um, and I'm part of a team now looking at what kind of tools and innovative ideas that we can incorporate in our work. Um, and that's, I'm here just to learn. But one of the challenges is um, all the presentations I've seen have been incredibly interesting and enlightening and the kind of thing that makes me think, oh yeah, like let me try and let's see if we can pilot this somewhere. But one of the challenges I have is where does the money come from to create bespoke versions or to apply some of these tools? Because where that money comes from can sometimes undermine the integrity of its application. Um, so I'd be curious to hear um, in terms of a, you know, like a practical takeaway, for people like me who are really keen to introduce some of these tools and technologies in developing contexts, um, who should fund it? Where should the money come from? And can we do it for free? And what are the risks of doing it for free? Thanks. There we go. Hello. Um, I'm probably just because of the area we work in best suited to answer this um, and my answer won't be helpful because in truth I don't know um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is in ways of keeping your, um, your operation free of bias and uh, free of influence from where the money comes from is, is maybe protecting the people that, who actually do the work from that so I don't necessarily know when we're working in Nigeria or Kenya who exactly is paying me um, and that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like if I don't know who's paying me, then then sh then I'm somewhat protected by the, from the bias and from the influence of that of that money. I know that doesn't like answer your question of where to get the money from, but um, but. It's useful because if, if you don't know, then that makes me feel less. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that a lot of people at this conference would be able to address that, though. So, so do keep asking the question, and don't feel too stupid to ask any question. What they said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, looks like we have some questions on the yes, left-hand side of the room. Hi, my name is Sahar Yadagari from uh, Adesium Foundation, which is a Dutch philanthropy organization. And uh, my question is to the last speaker. Um, I'm assuming that one of the main factors why um, this type of open dialogue could work um, if, uh, is basically the feedback loop uh, is completed. So um, when I um, share something with my uh, uh, with a parliamentarian or representative, I get feedback that that person is actually doing something with that uh, information, and I also experience this in real life. Um, is that a correct assumption? And to what extent uh, is that indeed the case? Um, you know, and, and, and do people not become completely um, uh, disappointed in, in, in their act of participation? Good question. Um, so yeah, the, the concept definitely is this idea that you could um, I mean, raise an issue uh, through something like a WhatsApp type uh, channel and and then on that so then an, an AI would be kind of in the middle of this conversation so you're sending something to your representative and either the representative does act on it or doesn't act on it but the I guess the computer in the middle of this conversation is updating you in a non-biased way um, and that is kind of keep feeding you information and the concept here is that you know, rather than you going to the, the newspaper and opening up and flicking through these stories that some of them are of interest to you and some of them are not of interest to you, that you're actually getting direct um, hits on topics that you have actually engaged on 
uh, from what is, I guess, a, a, a you know probably probably government-funded source. I'm not too sure, but uh, in some places. But uh, but it's on a topic that you've already engaged on, and it's it's meant to be kind of non-biased. Like here is what happened, and you can go elsewhere to find political commentary on that. And so that feedback loop, then, um, I think. It, you know, is something that's very we're, we're passionate about, and we showed in the in the pilot study with with our cork. Well, what not a perfect uh, sample uh, of the actual scenario because it was something that was actually it was it was based on most of the issues they receive are obviously are city issues and not policy issues. So, so the issues you can you can physically see a pothole fixed or something like that. Um, uh, so. But those who did receive feedback were far more likely not just to think that the, their voice was heard on that occasion, but actually to think that their 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 place in all of Irish society was um, was uh, I'm trying to think of the question there, but it was basically they they were for civically um, engaged in general and felt that they had a stronger voice. That was it uh, in in Irish society, which I think if we can create those kind of changes, even if it's perception, uh, that's um, very powerful for citizens. Hi, I'm John Brucey from Transparency International. My question is also for Johnny. Um, if I understood this correctly, this platform would allow people to communicate with their elected representatives, and their elected representative can then respond to a lot of people at the same time, so that saves time. Um, do you have any views on whether people should also be allowed to see what other people are saying to a representative and communicate with each other? Because as we know, group norms play a big role. Like, you know, if you know that a lot of other people are concerned about the local school being built or a lot of people are concerned about this new law or this other thing, you might also be more likely to take action on it. So if, if the interaction that you've designed is only from one individual to the representative, doesn't capitalize on the collective action opportunities. So, so quick question again. And one of the things that we wanted to, to move away from a little bit was, I guess, that change.org type thing where you need to create a, a narrative and build public mass appeal for your idea. Um, so a lot of those times, if you, if you have those kind of um, those type appeals, you have to create a black and white type um, argument and win the hearts and minds of people and really build a campaign to get critical mass to get your your issue kind of front and center of, of public representatives. Um, but uh, in, in the paper, we, well, the, the, last, um, the last principle is actually kind of around that transparency and, and part of it is uh, ensuring that this is a, basically a new form of lobbying in, in a way and that, uh, that there is means that you can actually see what, what politicians are hearing. Uh, on, on a kind of macro level, um, and so you know, if this was done by a, a platform like Facebook, they may build that into the front end to, to encourage people to engage. But uh, in, in the situation that we have, the the concept that we have just outlined there, that example, it's actually kind of it's a it's something it's a website that you can kick into where you can see what public representatives are hearing um, from their constituents or from other constituents. So that kind of has been built in. Yes, thank you. Uh, Margo Lohr from Estonia, Citizen OS. I have a question for Felipe. Um, there's uh, <coughs> the examples you were using in your presentation were sort of snapshots of when you're releasing a certain amount of data or a certain data set, what is the, the acceptable level of, of anonymity that, that you, you need to create. Um, our platform is being used by, by people for sort of citizen initiatives or citizen petitions that are then uh, given to the parliament. And, and the, the thing where Estonia is perhaps slightly different is that people are, are identified by, by the electronic uh, ID online. So, so you know for certain who voted for the petition, who voted against the petition, and, and what kind of petitions people are voting for. And, and <clears throat> this means that some, some um, organizations have raised the concern with us, and I think it's a legitimate concern, that um, over time, if you had access to this data, you would be able to profile people uh, based on, on their sort of political or, or social uh, concerns. On the one hand, we want to release uh, our data for, for researchers as, as open, open data, because a lot of the work that we're hearing here um, in this conference is based on um, platforms like ours generating this data that researchers can then use. My, my question is, um, if, if 
I, we're releasing a, a set of data today and making it anonymous to the required level, but then we release more data you know, the next month and the month after that and the year after that, and the data kind of builds up. Um, are, are there ways or approaches that either this API you introduced or, or sort of other, other tools can, can be used to make sure that even over time, you cannot profile specific people that, that even if, you know, today the data released was anonymous to a certain level, then after two or three or four further data releases, you wouldn't be able to narrow down the groups to, to start profiling people. Do, do you do? Um, see what I, I mean? I love the question. Now the answer is hard. Like mathematically, it's super hard to preserve anonymity. And, and that's why part of the, like, without knowing the answers, I love providing the thoughts and tools to start thinking about that and how hard it is. Like, yes, everyone agreed that we should do K anonymity 5 and then we are, we are fine. But we're not. Uh, that's why we develop our diversity, K-map, and all these metrics. But you are working against adversaries that the more data they collect, the, they can find out ways to de-anonymize. So it's super, super hard, and you need to live with some degree that we did the most we could while still providing a valuable service. We need the data for, for valuable purposes, but how do we become future-proof? It's a hard mathematical problem. Like, doesn't matter how much we talk about it. At the end of the day, there are mathematical ways that you can say this is a very, very hard problem to solve. But yes, we are in this together. We have a question on the aisle. Hi, it's Chloe Messenger from DAI. Um, Martin and John, you both mentioned um, how important designing with the user is. Um, and I was just wondering how far your organizations go with that, whether you hold like incubator style sessions or whether, um, Martin, you put up a picture of people going to the field and talking to people and also how far you think it's necessary to go, how much you need to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, and how much you can just get the data from research. Thanks. Yeah, well, in, in, in our field, actually, we're actually a user uh, research company. Um, we're we're use, user experience, um, and so most of that would be uh, research uh, driven from user interviews and things. So data is usually a secondary uh, information source or it would be collected from somewhere else and uh, so in in our field it actually in our in our consultancy it would actually be the primary primary kind of method of collection of data and and then we would review um, usage uh, of of tools if that was if it was a digital tool we might use uh, google analytics um, to 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 monitor that um, but it's always best to have that kind of um, qualitative information, and that would be kind of core to our, our um, principle. Uh, typically, at uh, my society, we, we don't very often start new things, but when we do start a new thing, talking to people one-to-one -one as soon as possible is probably usually the best place to start. Um, as we work quite iteratively, iteratively over existing products, we don't always speak to people directly. Um, but we do use things like um, surveys, um, analytics, lots of um, A-B testing. I don't know if you've come across that before, where you, know, you do one version of something, present to 50% of people on the live site. You don't set up a fake test, you do it with real people. Um, I, I, lo I love those questions where you get to say it depends, because it, it depends on exactly the problem you're, you're trying to answer. Looks <laughs> like... So, should we have th this person's first and then your second? Thanks. Um, Anish Dorabi from Apolitical. Um, this question is for Felipe. I just wanted to ask, um, it seems like, from one of your examples, it seems that healthcare is one of the areas where big data analysis and on top of that AI could be the most useful and have the most transformative effect. But at the same time, it seems another one of these places where um, Anonymity is one of the that has the highest stakes and where people care the most. As in, do you see? So first of all, is this um, what is holding this kind of advance back in healthcare? And also, is there a way around that problem, convincing people that 
their data will be, like, the incredibly personal data will be held safely? And, um, or is this a very similar problem to the, the previous one? Is it a tricky one to actually deal with? Yeah, um, that is something I think about a lot. Uh, again, I don't have the answers. I, my lawyers tell me to always say that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was talking to a researcher in imaging. They were doing their PhD. And basically, if you are at a university doing research on how to um, say, fix uh, breast cancer, you don't have data. Uh, there, they have very few data sets data points available, and that's a huge cost for our society. So we need, I think we need to make this more clear that, yes, we are protecting our privacy, which is good, but on the other hand, if these researchers had more data available, they could advance years forward uh, just by making more data available. And coming back to my, my favorite example is matches. Uh, do, we need to, we, do we need to make matches disappear? Can we make matches more sa safer? Or it's just about regulating how we do things? Like we can have dangerous things in our lives, uh, and the problem is not how dangerous they are, but yeah, don't start a fire. Uh, and that's regulated outside of what a match can and cannot do by itself. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, the solutions have to come from um, regulation from ethics of what you can do or what you cannot do with data instead of limiting data itself. Thanks. Thanks. Um, one is a quick comment for the lady who asked I, um, about whether connect, completing the loop results in genuine impact. Um, just before I came, I read a really good um, report called, um, oh, now my phone has died. Uh, Civic Tech in the Global South, Assessing Technology for the Public Good, and I really recommend it. And there's an interesting analysis around there are some contexts in which people don't care that they fail to deliver on what their promises because they're going to get voted in anyway. Uh, I won't make any comment about which places they are. Um, I have a question for, uh, I've forgotten your name, the Human Centered Design. Guy. John. John, hi John. Um, so at the moment, uh, I'm part of a team that's looking at how human-centered design can be incorporated in our work in African governments and specifically looking at piloting human-centered design research. Uh, and I'm very conscious of the fact that um, whether I like it or not, I'm going to be part of an elite and that there is a certain association with government. And I wondered if you had any recommendations or advice or some kind of framework looking at what can ethically guide the way that we do this research um, and that is respectful to vulnerable communities, but also just you know the, the, the inevitable power dynamic that comes from being an outsider doing research. Yeah, that's, that's, that's tough. Um, and there's a number uh, for, for, for researching uh, this um, we ended up, because we, again, we wanted to talk to disenfranchised people, so we went to the, one of the worst areas of Dublin, went to the pub, and just kind of actually just had chats in a not, we weren't writing the notes down, we just kind of wanted to bring up topics and, and explore them, which is something, which is a very slow way of kind of doing what you need to do. Um, one of the best ways of doing it, though, in, in, a, in a bit of a bigger picture, and outside of Ireland, um, is to find someone who is in the community who understands your plight. And then research with them, and then ask them to be kind of, I guess, a referral, and, and, and start using their, their networks. And so you have, you're kind of in whichever community it is um, that you need to be talking to, and you then have the, the person who the kind of you have that strength, so people feel more confident that they're getting a personal referral from somebody, and that person has some sort of of um, of, of clout. So the, the re first the, creating the relationship with that initial person is important, um, and that's typically quite a good way in terms of starting to, to to build trust. Another way of doing it is is to get someone from that community. So. You know, we do a lot of um, a lot of research in different countries, uh, and I, most of our research is not as sensitive as what you guys are doing. 
but we would have someone maybe from that country do the research, uh, research from that country, lead the research, just that it means that the l language barriers are, are broken uh, and I guess they feel more comfortable or confident speaking to that person, um, especially beyond kind of the surface level detail that they want to share. So I think those would be two things that I would point out in terms of breaking that, that gap, uh, which often is, is, is a tough gap to break.